Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this workshop on data science and AI, uh, its application in the real world and how it can further uh, your career as uh, a young professional. I'm Huda Hafez. I will be the moderator for this workshop. Uh, present will also be uh, Sabina Elkins, um, <laughs> um, our data science teacher who will be presenting the content of today's workshop and will be guiding you through our platform. Um, if any of you haven't signed up on our platform yet, uh, please do now. I will send uh, a link right now in the chat box uh, for you guys. There you go. Um, so the purpose of this is that you can be able to follow the module that Sabina will show uh, later on in the workshop, so halfway through. Um, I'd also like to note that there will be a Q&A in the end of the first uh, presentation uh, before the test run of the modules where you can send in your questions and uh, Sabina will uh, try her best to answer them. Uh, so yeah, I will, hand it, I will now hand it off to uh, Sabina. Hope you guys uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so you guys need to bear with me for a second while I set up my screen share. Um, okay. All right, so just to confirm in one second, can one of the other panelists let me know that they can see my presentation? All yep, good? All good. Okay, so uh, let me get started. All right. Okay, so hi everybody. So my name is Sabina and I am a data science teacher and content creator here at Corbett. I'm here today to talk about data science, which I'm pretty sure you can gather. Um, and I'm going to cover some basics of data science, where data science can take you, and then also give you some information about Corbett. But before I get to all of that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a recent graduate from McGill University in cognitive science, which if you don't know, is basically the study of how humans and machines think. I'll hopefully be starting a master's in 2021, centering on NLP, which is natural language processing, which is a branch of AI. So about four years ago, I took some introductory computer science classes and I just fell in love with it. And I started on my path towards data science. I'm sure that many of you have similar experiences and are studying in similar classes to what I have just recently taken. So I started working at Corbett this past spring and I've really loved my time here. The work I do is in content creation. So I'm making teaching videos, I'm making exercises, and I'm making the solutions to the exercises that exist on our platform. All right, so we're gonna dive right in with a big question, which is what is data science? I'm sure that all of you have an idea or even a lot of existing knowledge on the matter, but in case you don't, we're gonna look at it all together. So for starters, data science is a branch of computer science. Wikipedia says it is an interdisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights from many structured and unstructured data. That's pretty vague and wordy. So instead, let's just say that it is the field concerned with extracting knowledge from data. Data science extends miles beyond just exploratory data analysis of a data set, however. It includes things like using machine learning to control robots, predicting patterns of climate change, and furthering genetic research. Really, data science sits at the core of most of the cool innovations made in the field of computer science today. Moreover, data science extends into many other fields that aren't strictly based in computer science. In the healthcare field, data science is being used to predict the presence of tumors and other diseases, as well as things like um, predicting the spread of diseases, which is pretty relevant to us these days. Um, in marketing, data science can be used to understand more about a company's client base and to perform predictive marketing, which will help maximize the output and the revenue of a company. The educational field is also benefiting from data science, which you'll plainly see when I talk more about Corbett. But these are just a few examples. The bottom line is that data science is everywhere these days. Okay, so if all I've said thus far is not encouraging you to learn about data science, then I'm going to add this. Data science will make you employable. In 2016, IBM predicted that there would be 2.7 million jobs for data scientists in the US alone in 2020. This prediction was obviously affected greatly by the pandemic. 
But regardless, the data science job is still, data, bleh, sorry, the data science job market is still booming. Note that this huge number is reflected around the world too, with massive demands for employees who are confident with data science skills around the globe. In fact, Despite a global pandemic and a downturn market, my most recent search for data science jobs in Canada on LinkedIn returned over 4,000 results. Beyond being employed as a data scientist directly, having background knowledge in this field will bump your chances of getting a job in machine learning or AI or robotics or any other number of insanely cool computer science fields. As such, sophisticated knowledge in the data science field will undoubtedly improve your career, whether you work directly as a data scientist or within another field, which applies the tools that data science can provide. Okay, so where exactly can I go with data science? I'm just gonna geek out for a second and show you a few of what I think are the coolest things going on with data science right now. So first and foremost is one really cool application that is very near and dear to me is NLP or natural language processing. This is essentially a subfield of machine learning that uses text type data to do things like make intelligent chat robots, translate text to different languages, and it lets you talk to Alexa or to Siri. Another super different application is in the field of genomics. Here, data science can help with isolating genetic markers of diseases, the study of evolution through genomic similarities, and even more traditional, biology-related tasks, like figuring out how amino acid chains are properly folded into proteins. One final example that I can't help but include is robotics. There are tons of techniques in robotics that rely on algorithms that come directly from machine learning and data science. These can help to program and control robot robots to do everything, from assembling a car in a factory to driving around on Mars. So as I've said, data science is really at the cutting edge of, computers, of the computer science field at the moment. Gaining knowledge and experience in this field can help you start your career in computer science. Employers and supervisors are looking particularly for people who are well-versed in this field, for everything from university research positions to tech giant jobs to industry startups like Corbett. So that's an excellent segue to our next question, which is, what is Corbett? So Corbett can serve as an excellent home base for somebody looking to learn about data science. Let me tell you about the basics of our platform and you'll see why this is true for yourself. In the past three years, Corbett Technologies has been developing a real-time AI-powered, interactive, personalized, intelligent tutor. That's kind of a mouthful. So her name is Corby and she has proven to make a huge difference in learning outcomes and student motivation. A recent head-to-head -head study comparing similar courses on Corby and the online learning platform called Coursera showed that users studying with Corby had a 49.24% higher learning gain relative to students using Coursera. A core goal of Corby is to democratize education by providing high quality, interactive, and personalized educational content for people around the world. Our team is working to create a bridge from high school level content all the way to cutting edge approaches in data science in order to make data science accessible for people with any kind of background. So Corby teaches data science, machine learning, and prerequisites using a combination of video lectures, interactive dialogue, and problem solving exercises that can help you as a student to acquire new knowledge and skills or to refresh old ones. Our platform is designed to subvert the one-size-fits-all teaching approach that is used widely throughout online and large classroom education. This allows us to scale our personalized educational content to thousands of courses for millions of people with various backgrounds. Okay, so all of that was a lot of big talk, but what really makes Corbett stand out from other online teaching platforms? I'm gonna look a little bit more closely at the features that we have to offer in order to answer this question. So first and foremost, our intelligent tutor, Corby, is what sets us apart from similar platforms. Corby acts as a teacher and a guide on our platform. She leads users through their personalized skills and adapts to a user's learning style and understanding levels in real time. Corby engages in conversations, she offers live feedback, and she gives problem-solving exercises. When a student asks her a question or tells her their answer to an exercise, 
she is able to choose fitting feedback to give them. The AI will crunch the numbers and return a specific hint related to a student's answer or their question. As you can see in the diagram here, Corby iterates through many options before choosing a personalized hint. So let's look at each of her options just a little bit more. The first thing that Corby is able to do is to provide a textual hint to guide the student in the right direction. Not only does Corby use the teacher's solutions to do this, she also scrapes Wikipedia for the right answer to any question that you might have. Another thing that Corby is able to do is to suggest equations for math-related questions, which can help students figure out what formula will help them solve the exercise. Another possible hint that Corby can provide is to show a concept tree like the one that you see here. This is essentially a mapping of the top concepts to a tree structure in order to help the student understand relationships between the new concepts that they've learned. And finally, one more approach that Corby can take is to help you provide a, is to help you by providing a multiple choice version of the question. Sorry, excuse me a second. Okay. So, recently, Corbett published a study at the 21st International Conference on AI and Education in collaboration with Ekaterina Koshmar from the University of Cambridge and Joel Pinot from Mila and McGill. This study showed that the average learning gains with these personalized hints I just went over were 60.5%. Without them, the average learning gains were only 37.5%. So this means that students showed a 67% higher learning rate from having these personalized hints, which demonstrates just how beneficial Corby can be for students' learning outcomes. Okay, so let's move forward. Another advantage to our platform is the gamification we have implemented in order to keep students like you motivated. So as you can see here, students are led through a video game-like map where each node in the graph corresponds to a five to seven minute video created by our data science teachers like me, that explains the concepts required in detail. Then, students are provided exercises that enable them to solidify what they've learned, and completing these exercises earns you points. Once you've completed all of them, you get a rating out of three stars on that topic, as you can see here. The idea is to keep learning interesting by taking you on an adventure through your topic, where you get points for correct answers and for completing levels earning badges for certain milestones. This can help keep students engaged and entertained while they're learning. So another advantage to using Corby is the flexible curriculum that we provide. This feature in particular is related to students like you using Corbett as an educational tool, since it allows them the flexibility to alter their course according to what they're learning at school. So Corbett can be a tool to review harder topics and to enhance learning beyond what's shown in the classroom. So firstly, we personalize our students' learning path by asking questions about their knowledge level and their goals when they sign up. One example is shown on the screen here, but when any new user signs up, we have a series of questions like this that enable us to develop a unique learning path that fits the goals and needs of each student. We also provide them with flexibility within their provided curriculum. Essentially, this feature means that the student is free to move around in their curriculum as they choose eliminating the strict linear path that exists with other courses. Students can jump forwards or backwards as needed to review old material or to skip over things that they already are comfortable with. The flexible curriculum lets Corbett offer an impressive 500 unique learning paths. As our platform grows and we increase the amount of content that we have to offer, this number is only gonna get bigger. This fact gives us a distinct leg up over our competitors considering that in comparison, online courses like Coursera, which I mentioned before, only offer one strict learning path. Okay, so one of the last features I'm gonna to present to you is our programming tutor. So in order to teach real world data science applications, we've implemented Corby as a programming tutor. She provides coding exercises in Python, which as you may or may not know, is one of the most popular programming languages for data science. Through the testing of submitted solutions, Corby is able to isolate errors in your code and provide feedback to help you create a working program. Being able to code efficiently is a critical skill for any data scientist, and Corby can just help you learn to do that. All right, and the last feature um, is our certificate. 
So at the end of your course with Corby, you attain a certificate from us. This is something concrete that you can add to your CV to demonstrate to employers the work you've put in to understand and practice your data science skills. All right, so in summary, you all know that data science is an expanding field that already provides a massive opportunity for young computer scientists. I've presented Corby as a convenient and advantageous tool for learning and mastering data science. Corbett's unique features are an excellent approach to help you hone your skills and to learn new things. Uh, Huda, you're muted. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, this very informative and thorough presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for all questions uh, that you guys might have or might want to ask. Um, please feel free to ask them through the Q&A, little Q&A uh, box right there or through the chat box. We've already have, we already have a couple, so I'm gonna ask them. Um, but please, like, as the questions pour in, I will ask, uh, um, I will ask them one by one. So first question uh, is, how is cognitive science similar to data science and how is it different? Um, okay, to answer this question, uh, I think I might need to explain cognitive science a little bit more. So cognitive science is kind of a big hodgepodge of a bunch of different disciplines. So within cognitive science, you have computer science, hence my um, relation to data science, but you also have neuroscience, you have psychology, there's linguistics, and there's philosophy. So all five of those things wrap together um, in order to help you understand the study of how humans and machines think, which is kind of the tagline of the course. So these two, I mean, um, you can see how data science is related to AI in the sense that there are lots of machine learning algorithms that help us produce AI. Um, for example, Corby, our big machine learning algorithm of the day is a collection of different data science techniques built all into one chat, interactive, intelligent person. Um, and so cognitive science and data science are related in the sense that they're both working towards AI, but they're also different because data science can do a lot of other things than AI. It can also um, be just used in machine learning that is less focused on creating a um, intelligent robot or um, entity, which is kind of the main focus of AI in the traditional sense. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of my answer as to how they're similar and different. They're very related to each other, but they're not, I, I would say that data science can go in many other paths and cognitive science um, is using the AI related part of data science, but also has other parts of it that are more philosophical um, or more related to the arts. Okay, uh, second question, uh, what are some cool projects for beginners? Well, I mean, for starters, there's a few cool projects on our platform, but um, if you've ever heard of the website Kaggle, they have some cool projects for beginners. Um, and in order to be able to complete them, you could train on Corbett and then try to do the cool projects. But it's always a good idea if you want to get started in data science and machine learning to uh, build up your knowledge base and then try to run these applications on your own. So trying to execute a machine learning algorithm, something more simple like a binary classification algorithm, which basically just tells you um, binary classification means you categorize your data as yes or no. Um, so an algorithm like that. Uh, but a cool project for a beginner would be to do something like that. For example, in the binary classification video on our platform, we use a data set about um, passengers on the Titanic, and then you have to predict whether they'd survive or not when the Titanic hits the iceberg. So a cool project for a beginner would be something like that um, to start you on your journey. And then once you've done smaller things like that, you can build up to more complicated questions. Also, I think the, the Kaggle, um, the Kaggle, uh, their competitions, and I think they're, they, 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 they're, they have a, a reward by the end of it, if you yeah. win. And uh, I saw them, they're, huge sums of money. I think it's like $2,000. Yeah, Kaggle is really cool and they yeah. have lots of projects. Yeah. Um, 
I would say that maybe for beginners, you should start with some easier ones before you aim for the $2,000 rewards. But definitely, the more experience you get, the more you can enter cool competitions like this. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question. Does Corby change the roadmap based on how well you do um, and what, or what you seem to have trouble with? Or is the unique path set, uh, set in stone? Well, right now on our platform, when you're handed a unique path, that's kind of what you get. And you're allowed to move around in it as you please. Um, if you want to ensure that you get the most content available, kind of think about that when you're answering the sign up questions to say, like, I want to learn a lot, you know. Um, but coming soon, hopefully, as a new feature on our platform, we'll be updating as every uh, with every launch and all the new data that we add to the platform. Um, students will have their path updated and they'll be able to see all the content that exists on our platform but isn't in their path and we'll be able to add it in but we're not there yet so you have to give us a little bit okay so uh last question um last question on the platform guys please feel free to, to send any questions that you have uh but uh Ra raul is asking how important is it to understand um the the good working of an algorithm rather than just knowing what the what algorithm does in the context of data science right i think his question is kind of like how important is it to understand the math under the hood mm -hmm. in order to apply it in data science which i guess is up to you i would argue that understanding the math is only going to push you further but if you're only looking to apply data science tangentially in a job that's like kind of related, being able to apply the algorithm, even if you don't really understand it, but you understand what you have to feed it and what you're gonna get out might be enough. But personally, I think at the very least, you could use something like Corbett, that's a little bit fun, um, a quick educational tool that can help you understand the basics of the inner working of an algorithm. And that will help you in fields that are actually more based in computer science. So what I'm saying is that you don't need to understand what's going on under the hood unless you really want to be directed in computer science. If you just want to use data science outside of the field of computer science in the healthcare field or um, any of the other fields that I mentioned earlier, then you might not necessarily need to know what's under the hood. I have a question actually. If you're someone who just applies or enters data into an algorithm and then gets data out, would that person be called a data scientist as, as their job title? Right. It's very up in the air. There's a lot of different kind of definitions, but some people might call that kind of job a data analyst. Mm -hmm. So it's somebody who would really understand something like exploratory data analysis. They'd be able to tell all of the fluctuations in their data and understand all the features and then they'd be able to apply algorithms, but they might not necessarily be somebody working at a tech startup. They'd be somebody working at a bank, you know, who's getting all this data, but isn't necessarily really deeply immersed in data science. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, thanks. No problem. Okay, that is all the questions uh, I have. Um, if any of you want to send in more, I'll give it maybe a minute. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, and then we'll move on to uh, the demo and testing out the module. Yeah, and if you think of a question during the demo too, um, just send it in the chat and I will try to check back and look for that. Okay, it looks like no further questions are coming in at the moment. Uh, so we will just move on. Uh, so for this part uh, of the workshop, uh, you can now be on the Corbett website uh, that you have signed up on so that you can follow Sabina as she guides you through the platform. Uh, I will now be sending out a poll that will ask everyone what topic they'd like to demo. 
Uh, as you'll note shortly, you'll be given three options, uh, descriptive statistics, conditional probability, and binary classifications. Uh, please choose the one that interests you the most. And don't worry if you guys don't have the, the same module uh, as Sabina. Since the platform is personalized, as you know, uh, every, everyone's path will look different depending on your level of knowledge. Uh, so just uh, follow through if you don't have it. Sabina will share her screen and everything will be uh, clear. OK, so um, let me do the poll so that you guys can. OK. I think, uh, Sabina, you're the one who has to do the poll because uh, you're the host. I'll just transfer you the host yeah. status. Make host. OK, perfect. So let me add a question. Sorry, this is taking so long. Zoom okay. is a struggle of its own. <laughs> okay. I think I should be allowed to add from that now. Have you sent the poll? I'm um, doing it right now, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it should, uh, I launched it and it should, perfect. Uh, did you guys get it? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Okay, we've got 50% uh, for binary classification, 58% for descriptive statistics, and 42% for conditional probability. So descriptive statistics, I'm sorry, you win. <laughs> sorry for everyone else. Um, but I mean, I'm pretty sure you'll find it interesting uh, too. And you can always go on our platform and try it out for yourselves. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and this is just to, sh to, sh to show you the module and show you how it works and, uh, and, and, and yeah, so it's, uh, I'll, I'll okay. give it to, to Sabina right now just so she can present. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again. So, um, you need to make me the host. Yes. Um, I'm jumping back and forth here. Okay. So, uh, Okay, you are now the host. Change host. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So, I'm going to share this. And can you guys see the Corbett homepage? Okay, great. 
So we're going to have to go through the sign up flow altogether. So if you've already done this, excuse the repetition. Um, but we're going to click sign up. So like I said, Corby's going to ask me all these questions. Um, I'm going to apply kind of the most general answers to try to get the most content. Um, so I'm going to say I have a little bit of experience. Um, I'm going to say that I want to learn absolutely every skill that she has offered me. So we're going to click continue. And then she's asking me some background questions and I'll say that I have a bit of experience with everything. Great, we'll click continue. And then I definitely prefer to learn by coding. Um, and I'm gonna spend a whole whack of time on Corbett, so 10 hours a week. All right, so now I'm just gonna use um, a test Corbett email um, so that it doesn't mess up our platform. It's just something that they do for uh, employees at Corbett. I'm going to, you should definitely read the terms and conditions. So I'm just going to click yes. Um, and we're going to load up the platform. Okay, great. So we agreed on descriptive stats, right? Yes. Um, so I am going to skip over the tutorial, but I do recommend doing it on your own time. Um, even just after this, it takes maybe 30 seconds. Um, and it's really helpful to make sure that you orient yourself right on the platform. Um, but we'll start in at descriptive stats just so we can see it. So right when we start, we load up, we get this video. Um, I'll play the first 30 seconds of it, but the audio might be a little bit weird because it's through my computer through Zoom. Um, but again, in practice, when you're doing a module on our platform, you'd watch the whole video because you need everything presented in the video to answer subsequent questions. But we'll just start watching a little bit. The branch of statistics concerned with describing and summarizing data is called descriptive statistics. To begin, let's introduce the two types of variables you'll encounter when summarizing data, categorical and numeric. A categorical variable typically has a small number of possible values, which can be thought of as classes or categories. For okay, so I'm going to take over um, from my coworker, Nathan, whose voice you heard. Um, but I'm just going to point out a few things about this video to you. And again, in practice, you'd watch the whole thing. But since I'm helping you through, I already know all the material that's needed for this video, so we don't need to watch it. Um, but if you see the closed captions here, um, you can turn the subtitles on and you can also change the language. So a lot of our videos have lots of different languages that are subtitled, um, which can help you if you are uh, more comfortable in a language other than English. Unfortunately, you can't yet change Corby's voice from English, um, but at least this way it'll help you understand the material a little bit better. So once you've watched the whole video, you'll get to the end. And then you'll be able to click move on, or you could just write, okay, I'm done here and talk to Corby that way. So now she's thinking and she's telling me she's ready and let's move on. And so this is the part in the video where she starts, sorry, this is the part in the module where she starts giving me some exercises. So um, uh, if you guys can all see my screen, if anybody wants to shout out what they think the answer might be, um, and then I'll go through, uh, I guess you can't shout out, shout out in the chat what the answer might be. And if no one can figure out how to take the meat of a list, then uh, I'll help you out. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. And then um, I'll have to pull out my own calculator to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I would give it a try. I'm just really bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Um, uh, so Ariel is asking, is the mean just the average? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess that would have been presented to you in the video, but um, a different word for average is mean. And then you talk about uh, three central statistics, which are mean, median, and mode. So mean is the average, median is the middle point, and mode is the most common point. 
So the mode here would be 11. Okay. Have we got some answer ideas? We got some answers. Okay. Uh, so Raul is saying 10. Okay. Uh, and Ariel is saying, uh, so te uh, 10 would be the median here. I'm mean. Is that what you said? Is that what you mean? Ariel, do you mean 10 would be the median or the mean? Mean. Okay, mean. Okay, we're trying 10. Great. <laughs> Corey, think you're right. Um, often, um, this is kind of funny, especially because a lot of our answers are sentence answers. Corby will suggest you another way that she would have solved the exercise based on teacher solutions. But sometimes she tries to do it anyways, even though it's only a number answer. So you write 10 and then she tells you, I would have solved it by writing 10. Um, but obviously that's how we did solve it. Okay, so we've got another question here, which is asking us about eight runners in a hundred meter dash and their times are recorded. And it's gonna ask us what variable is represented by their race times. Um, so I'll give you the options between a categorical variable and a numeric variable, both of which are presented in this video. So a categorical variable is one where the values represent one out of a number of categories. And a numerical variable is a variable where the values are numbers. Um, so if anybody has an idea as to what this one might be. Yeah, so just, a, just one question. Um, so Hamza is asking what happens if you write 10 instead of, so 10 as in letters instead of 10 as in a, a, a number. Right, so the AI algorithm is pretty smart and has a lot of um, different ways to answer the question built in. And she should be able to correctly recognize that 10 and 10 are the same. And she would say, sounds great, let's move on. However, occasionally she kind of messes it up, but as we get more people on the platform and more people answering the questions, her knowledge base of a correct answer for a particular exercise grows. And then that knowledge base can help her more accurately predict when a student has gotten the question right or wrong. So if, for instance, in this case, you wrote 10 and then she was like, no, it's wrong. And you said, actually, I'm pretty sure that's the right answer. Um, the next student who came along who wrote the word 10 rather than the number 10 would be marked as correct because she learned in theory. I mean, that's a simplified version of how it happens, but so that's force, the idea. You can Pardon force the, that you can force her to believe that your answer is correct. Um, often it happens that if you say 10 and then you write a response saying, no, my answer is correct. She'll say, oh, okay, I have to look at that one. And then she kind of moves over it. Um, and often also if you write an answer that she's not sure about, so say your question was um, something asking you to write a whole sentence and your response, you know, it takes a little bit more for her to check if your sentence is correct. And she goes, you know, this is pretty close. I'm not sure if it's correct or incorrect. Um, and she'll ask you a question. She said, she would say to you, does it make sense if I reward it to this? And then you have the option to write like, yes, that makes sense. You're more correct than I am. Or actually, no, my answer is correct. And then she will take that correct answer that you're verifying mm -hmm. and compare it to a whole other whack of students' correct answers and then um, learn that way. So would, would it wouldn't be possible if for someone to kind of keep putting wrong answers and saying, no, this is the right answer and ruin, <laughs> ruin her? Yeah, like yeah absolutely. But it's not as though Corby believes you right away. You know what I mean? So you need to build up. Um, there's two ways to kind of get a new right answer verified. It needs to build up a whole whack of, like you as a student need to build up credibility, if that makes sense. So if you're continually getting answers correct on the platform, she might believe you more than an average student. Mm -hmm. And then also if, um, Corby is getting an influx of answers that are all, people are saying, no, this is right, no, this is right. And then she performs clustering, which groups similar data points together. And she groups all of the people who are saying, no, this answer is right together into one correct answer. She will start to approve answers that belong in that cluster and say, you know what? Everyone is saying this is right. We have a lot of data. I'm pretty sure your answer belongs in this cluster. I'm gonna mark it as correct. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay.
So for the question, we actually have three people who answered, uh, okay. and they all, uh, Raul, NG, and Ariel, all answered numerical. And that's correct. So we answer back to her, and she's saying precisely that's the right answer. And um, this goes on, and you just have more answers. So if you have any more questions about how she works, feel free to hit them up, but also give me the answers to the questions so we can move forward. So range, if anybody can think about what that statistic means. Um, okay, so there's a question. Yeah. Um, is there any reason why you're not being asked coding questions? Right, so coding questions come at the end of the module. And if you're interested, we can skip through all the questions and then look at it all together, um, which might be cool, actually, since we've seen a few of them. Do you guys think that's a good idea? Okay, so there are less coding exercises on the platform. But as a general rule, we try to have at least one for every, um, we call them sub modules, but like descriptive statistics is like a topic. We have, try to have at least one for every topic. Um, so we'll skip through these questions. Um, NG She's actually gonna... has an answer. So she oh, has 10.56 <laughs> 10. to 11.99. Um, I think that's quite right, but I already clicked skip it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna skip through so we can look at a programming exercise together. Right, and then interspersed throughout the chat, Corby will ask you questions like this. So I skipped two exercises in a row and she's saying, can you tell me why you skipped it? Um, and then you can add feedback in this way also that can help Corby learn. So if you say the question isn't clear and Corby gets a lot of responses saying the question isn't clear, she'll flag that response and say, hey guys, maybe we need to check this question because everybody thinks it's not clear. Um, and I'm going to skip again, and she's probably going to tell me, um, you need to practice. <laughs> it's really understand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, it is under, it is important to practice. That's the whole point of having all these exercises, right? Is so that you're able to practice as you go through. And this is what helps you solidify. And this is what creates better learn, learning gains with Corbett. The only reason we're skipping through right now is so that we can get to a programming one. Oh, but here's a good example. So she has seen me skip a bunch. And then she goes, hmm, maybe I'll give you a multiple choice version so that you actually try to answer this question. So she's given me this question. Maybe we can answer this because it'll be quick. She says, suppose that your email spam detector predicts emails as spam or not spam. So what type of variable do these predictions present? Okay, we have an answer from Arielle. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Catag mm, she, okay. Ariel and Raul uh, say binary. Yeah, that's correct. And NG2. Right. So categorical variables um, are binary variables. Or I guess it makes more sense to say binary variables are categorical var variables, but not the other way around. Um, yeah, I'm sure you guys all know that. I don't need to be your teacher here. Um, OK, we're almost at the end. So we have about, on average, 10 exercises for every uh, video. but. We're getting another video now. So occasionally in the module, um, the videos are split. So if there's too much to say in one video, because the videos, we try to make them short so they're easy and you don't lose patience, um, then the module will be split into two videos. And Corby asks you to help spread the word, which if any of you would like to do, we'd be very grateful. Um, I think we're coming up on the programming one. We might need to answer a few more questions, but she's asking me for more feedback. I'm gonna pick at random. I would suggest not picking at random because it will skew our data. The only reason I can do it right now is um, I created a test account, if you remember. So it's kind of like hidden. Ah, here we go, okay. So here's our programming exercise, kind of what it looks like. It takes a second because it has to download Python onto the web browser that it's on. Um, so Corby shows us a problem statement and then we have to 
complete the problem statement by answering the question on the right. So here is our coding exercise, which is a treasure hunt. So it's saying that teams of kids participate in a treasure hunt. Their finishing times and minutes are stored in the list times. Your goal is to find the minimum and they're for the best time. So this is a simple exercise, just asking you to use kind of one function. Um, if anybody is familiar with Python, they might be able to let me know what that function might be to find the minimum of a list. Um, or actually, I guess, sorry, excuse me. She's not asking you to use min, although that is a, a cheat way that you could answer the problem. She's asking you to use a for loop. So if anybody has a suggestion on how I'd use a for loop to answer this question. Um, but yeah, this is an example of what a coding exercise would look like on the platform. She'll give you a little question over here in the chat, and then she will give you um, a set of instructions and an example. So in this example, if we ran find best time with this list, we'd return the minimum, which is 41. Um, so if we're gonna do it in the for loop way, we say for, um, and I will leave the rest of this for loop if anybody wants to give me the statement. Okay, so Ariel answered. Um, so for time and times, uh, if time is less than best underscore time, less best underscore time, yes. And then best underscore time is equal to time. Perfect. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is um, now, once I've entered what I think my solution is, what happens is I want to click submit and then it'll show me the output. So it kind of boots you out as soon as you get a correct answer, which will change because we're updating the format of programming exercises. But here we can see when we ran this example, the answer that we got was 25 and it correctly found the best time. Um, but in the case where you didn't get the question right, I'll have to skip through a whole other module to find you another exercise, so I won't do that. But in the case where you didn't get the question right, Corby would be able to say, hey, your code throws a division by zero error, or your code throws a syntax error, or did you forget to update this variable? And then that way, she'll give you kind of hints and like isolate parts where your code is not working in order to prompt you to um, fix the particular part that you need to fix to get the exercise right. So she's helpful in that way as a programming tutor. Um, yeah, and then we'll say, I would rate this module five out of five. And then as I said, she gives you a set of stars. We did not very well because we skipped a lot of exercises. But if you go back to the map, you can see now that we have started our way to learning how to explore data and we've completed one of our modules. Um, so I, I guess it's kind of late now, uh, so I will stop the presentation, but feel free to spend some time today or whenever you have time um, to go and explore the map. And as you can see, there's introductory things all the way to more complex machine learning. Here we're all the way in deep learning, right? So that's very difficult uh, machine learning content. So as you go through, you're going to improve your knowledge and enjoy your time with Corby. Yeah, Arielle is saying that that's really cool. She guides you towards the answer like a mentor might. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the programming tutor is really cool. Uh, I've been working on it in the fall and it's pretty new and really fun. So I encourage you to go try it out. Okay. Thank you so much, Sabina. It was a beautiful workshop. <laughs> um, thank you for everyone who attended and participated with us today. If any of you have any further questions either about the workshop, the platform itself, or just general questions about data science and AI, please send uh, them through the email that I will send in the chat box. Uh, don't hesitate to send anything. Uh, this is the email we uh, provide for uh, every, anyone who needs uh, our support or answers or, or, or um, mentorship on anything. So mm -hmm. thank you for every, everyone and um, Oh, thank you, Angie. Uh, Angie says that she really likes the platform. Thank you very much, everyone. Good to hear. Um, yeah. And I hope uh, you all spend some time uh, getting to know the platform and exploring it yourself. Okay.
thank you so much, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thank you guys so much. This was so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.